one, while I'm thinking of this, um, bonus point opportunity. The Saks Club is running a food drive for Second Harvest, and that runs from last Friday through this Friday. And if you can bring in canned food, it has to be something canned that's not perishable. But for each can you bring in, that's one bonus point, up to a limit of five points. Right. And if you do that, I need to know that you're bringing it in. So what you would need to do is bring it to class or my office. Um, have whatever cans you've got, have them in a plastic bag, put your name on that, and just give it, put it on the back counter here, or give it to me in my office. And that way I can check your name off the list, get the points entered, and then I'll put them in the little collection boxes. Deadline for that, though, is this Friday. So if you're looking for bonus points, that's an opportunity. Are you getting what you're supposed to on number 16? For a gas, in this case we're talking about ammonia, does its molarity change as a function of temperature and pressure? Yes, it does. Does its density change as a function of temperature and pressure? Yes, it does. And the whole reason for that is both molarity and density have this volume component. When you heat something, that doesn't change how much it weighs, correct? Mass is not a variable, depending upon temperature and pressure, but volume is. You heat something, it tends to expand. You cool it, it tends to contract, correct? Because both of those are volume-based, you will have different numbers for molarity and density at different temperatures and pressures. Those are variables for gases. Does molar mass change as a function of temperature and pressure? No. Molar mass comes strictly off the periodic table, correct? Molar mass is simply mass, and mass does not change when it's heated. Volumes change when they're heated, and therefore density and molarity change. They both have a volume component. Now, number 17. Looking back at 14 and 15 and 16, number 17 looks horribly redundant because all I've done is change the temperature and pressure again. But this one is important because there's something important about this particular temperature and pressure. Because things are so variable, depending upon your experimental conditions, these conditions are defined as standard. And as much as, pop as possible, people tend to do their experiments at those conditions. And if that's not practical, they'll adjust the data afterwards to what it would have been at standard temperature and pressure, because that makes it easy to compare. Zero degrees Celsius, 760 torr are defined as standard temperature and pressure, or if you want to have these in Kelvin and atmospheres, this would be the value. Now we would work that the same way as we worked the previous ones. Temperature becomes Kelvin, pressure becomes atmospheres, you plug that into your gas law, and so forth. You do get a convenient shortcut out of defining standard temperature and pressure though. And that's 
called standard molar volume. And the mathematics of it is one mole of any gas at standard temperature and pressure, STP, standard temperature and pressure, one mole of any gas fills 22.4 liters. That's a constant. That's not necessarily something that you have to memorize, but it's awfully convenient if you do, because it can shorten problems quite a lot. problem 17. I'm going to go ahead and do this the original way and then I'll do it using standard molar volume so that way you've got it in your notes both ways. But if we're calculating the density of the ammonia at zero degrees at 760 torr, then the pressure would be one atmosphere. That's the formal, official way to do it, like we did back in the previous problems. The way to do that same thing using your shortcut is if you recognize this to be standard temperature and pressure, then we can go straight to this shortcut and use that as a conversion factor. One mole of ammonia, 22.4 liters, One mole of ammonia, 17.03 grams. Done. For this part here, it's just a convenient shortcut. about that shortcut. On your calculator, divide 1 by 22.4. Yeah. Do you see how that is phrased as a shortcut to all of this? is to save you from having to do uh, all these steps over and over and over again. Question. Essentially, this is saying 0 0.0446 moles in one liter. For that conversion is saying one mole is 22.4 liters. It's the same ratio. This looks different from that, but mathematically that is the same ratio. Now, again, there's nothing necessary about that standard molar volume 
Because if you don't remember that conversion, you can still work it. But it's convenient to remember that shortcut because that can turn a five minute problem into a 30 second problem. If you remember the conversion, and if, this is the bigger if, you only use it when you're supposed to. What we've got there, that's a legitimate shortcut for problem 17, but it would not have worked on 16 or 15 or 14 because 16, 15, and 14 were not at standard temperature and pressure. The biggest problem with that conversion is people use it when they shouldn't. It is only valid if you're at standard temperature and pressure. So watch your experimental conditions and make sure that it's valid and appropriate to use it. Question about that? Any questions? Now this is going back to the very first problem we did, which was an ideal gas law calculation. Sealed container, 400 milliliters volume. This was our pressure, this was our temperature. We wanted to know how many moles of argon were present. P, V, N, and T. So it would go ideal gas law. We would rearrange that to solve, oops, to solve for N. Correct? I'm not going to do all the math on that because you've got it in your notes already. But you convert each of those variables into proper units, plug them in, solve for your moles. You remember doing that? All right. What's the difference between this problem and the previous one? Standard temperature and pressure, correct? So, 400 milliliters. Thousand milliliters is a liter. 22.4 liters. Question about that. Now the next one after that is the same as the one we just did, except it more explicitly tells you that you're at standard temperature and pressure. Don't expect that all the time. You need to know what temperature is standard, what pressure is standard, so that you recognize those units and that will cue you into go into your shortcut. Occasionally it might tell you like this one does, but most of the time not. So you have to recognize units. Any question? All right, last thing about gases then.
the assumptions we made about ideal gas law that we were enabled us to apply the same set of equations to everybody were that there were no molecular attractions and molecular size was negligible. Lots of empty space and the particles don't stick together. No molecular attraction, molecular size negligible. We assumed that the vast majority of the space was empty space and the particles simply ricocheted. Nobody attached. Experimentally, there are conditions where that fails. First of all, one of those conditions is very high pressure because if you force them down into a small amount of volume, if you take away most of that excess space, then molecular size isn't negligible anymore. Compared to the volume of the container, they make up an appreciable chunk of that volume now. And the big ones will behave a little different than the small ones. The other is decreasing temperature because when you decrease temperature, as they slow down, they don't just bump and ricochet, they start to associate and form droplets and condense out, like water vapor does. So at cold temperatures, at very cold temperatures, the molecular attractions start to kick in and your gas laws don't work anymore. Don't work as well, I should say. And at very high pressure, molecular size becomes important again and your, your gas law equations don't work work as well anymore. So like, so like with most other things, there are limitations. Gas laws work great, unless you are at extremes of very high pressure, very low temperature. Because that's when our two initial assumptions start to break down. up here is to help illustrate that. Do not write this down. This is not testable. This is trivia. All right. What's standard temperature in Celsius? Zero. Zero. Only in gas law is standard temperature zero. In every other aspect of chemistry, standard temperature is 25 degrees whether it's electrochemistry or heat or whatever other topic you want to look at, standard temperature is defined as 25. The reason it's different for gases is because of water. Water gave them problems. They had a set of gas laws over there on the right that worked great for everybody but water because water vapor gave them condens condens bleh bleh, condensation problems at 25 degrees. What happens to water at zero? It freezes, right? So what they did, rather sneaky kind of thing, they redefined the zero point to where water would freeze out and not even be gas phase, and then their equations worked beautifully. If you freeze water out, it's not a variable anymore, and now your set of equations work great. Right? A little bit of a gimmick here on why they defined the gas laws at zero. Right. And experimentally, it was a matter of convenience. But hopefully that's just a little bit of an illustration of what we're talking about here. Water gave them condensation problems at 25 degrees. That was an example of, for water, a what would be considered a lower temperature. That was close to its condensation point. Anyhow, enough of that. Question about gas laws. Your equations are over there on the right, as far as your four main gas laws. We also did the molarity and the density and molar mass, those kinds of calculations based on those gas laws. Any questions on any of those? Yes. Uh, 
How would be the best way to go about like knowing that, like memorizing knowing the uh, practicing them in problems and knowing the context for each one so that you know which law applies to which problem. And the patterns there were with the ideal gas law, you never had changing conditions. Combined gas law, there's always changing conditions. Dalton's law, you're dealing with a mixture. And then Graham's law, you're dealing with rate of diffusion. Each one's got its own unique uh, niche, I guess you would say. And then there were some, like that one that we did that collected over water, one where it had a little bit of Dalton's and a little bit of Ideal, both in the same problem. Let's try one like this.
getting 0.514. Give or take a little bit around it. Can you go through it to the point where you've already made your like conversions and subtracting all of that just like where you make the actual end? The subtraction is to get oxygen's part of that total pressure, and that's 782 torr. And that's what you convert to atmospheres. So that came out to be like 1.03 atmospheres. Your temperature, you add 273 to get that to Kelvin. So that's 294 Kelvin. And your volume is a factor of a thousand, so that's 0.375 liters. So then, which gave me this for moles. Now this time I didn't, this time I rounded more than I did the first time and I'm getting 0.512 as opposed to 0.514. But depending on different variations in rounding, it should be pretty much the same. Are you getting 0 0.51 something? Don't multiply the end by 16, multiply by 32, because you're dealing with diatomic oxygen. So it'd be 0, 1, 6, 0 moles of oxygen times 32 grams per mole to get your grams. Question? Does that answer your question or not? Yeah, I don't understand that last The 0160 is moles. We're wanting mass, which is going to be a gram conversion. So once we get done with all the gas law stuff, we still have a molar mass to do. I thought it was grams divided by moles, though. That's molar mass. Yeah, we're not solving for molar mass. We're just looking for the actual mass that's in the container. Since we know who it is, we can get molar mass straight off the periodic table. So we're using molar mass to convert moles to grams. Question? Any questions?
lot of math in this section. You need to practice enough to where you know the context of when to use ideal, when to use combined, when to use Dalton's, when to use grams. When's your next exam? Monday after Thanksgiving. Yeah. So we have two classes left? We have two more classes. Yeah. We don't have Wednesday yeah, Wednesday class. Class. So we have Wednesday's class and then the exam. And then Monday. We'll have this Wednesday, next Monday, we have No, Wednesday, Monday, Wednesday. Yeah. Three classes, so I guess. We don't have class for Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Right. We don't have no. Okay, so today is Monday, then here's Wednesday. This is where we start equivalent way. Then next Monday we have class. And then the next Wednesday, that's the one before Thanksgiving, and we do. And then this Monday is the test? Yes. Okay. So we got one more class before the test then. Alright. Two. Two. Two? Two. Today's Monday. Ah, yes. Okay. Alright. All right. Alright. So this is equivalent way, and this is equivalent way, and then here comes the exam. Okay. So two days on gas law, which we just did, two days on equivalent weight, which are coming up. The equivalent weight stuff will be very much like what we did here in that the first day we'll do the bulk of it, and the second day will be a little bit of application and adaptations on it, right? So exam is two weeks from today, um, and you've already seen half the material. All right. Between now and Wednesday, work a lot on this gas law stuff. Okay. Don't bother looking ahead at equivalent weight. Um, there's very little about equivalent weight in your textbook, and what is in your textbook is garbage. Don't read it. My stuff online is much, much better. All right. So don't bother looking ahead. Work on gas laws a lot, and then we'll just take equivalent weight when we get to it. All right. Thank you.